So Phineas, about three weeks ago, he was staying at the house with Papa. And he said, Papa, very clearly, three times. The next day, when Betty and Shay were over to collect said child, child, I said, look, 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 he says, Papa. He said, Papa. And that's about how it went. <laughs> and, and then Benjamin said, he said, Papa, and he says, Papa. Never again. But we were, uh, I am not above a little bribery. And so uh, I had some ice cream, and I was sharing it with him. And before I would let him take a bite, he had to say, Papa. <laughs> he says, Papa. I have video recording of him saying, Papa. Unfortunately, he thinks Papa means ice cream. <laughs> right? Right? Yeah? You don't like being up front, do you? Everybody's looking at you. So, uh, you know, if you happen to be talking with him, feel free to say, say, Papa. Uh, we'll break it up a little bit and, you know, hopefully I won't be ice cream for the rest of his life. <laughs> All right. Um, we are going to continue uh, with our testimonies. Um, I have been a little remiss in having people come and share uh, where God brought them out of and what he's brought them to. Uh, all too often we celebrate our testimony of something that he brought us out, but the bringing us out was to bring us to. Okay? It's, it's not just something that's in the past, it's something we are looking forward to. So uh, I asked Brian if he would be willing to come and share with us. So the pulpit is yours, but not my notes. I'm moving my notes. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, um, last week he was talking about uh, persecuted Christians and stuff like that, and that has a big part in my testimony. Um, as a lot of you I've talked to here already know, um, I was a member of the U.S. military. I was part of the U.S. Army as a combat medic. Um, I spent four years as active duty and another eight nine as National Guard, and I have three deployments. I've been to Iraq twice and Afghanistan once. Um, while I was overseas, I had some very, very interesting encounters that brought me to understand how great the Lord really is. But to go back before that, in high school, my mother was a Christian. Um, she very much made me come to church, which I was okay with because, you know, my mom did a lot for me. She was a single mom, so I would, you know, give up my time on Sunday and go to youth group and do all that, but it never really resonated well with me. I never truly believed in what they were saying. I was always doing it to please my mom. I was always doing it as something and saying what those around me wanted me to hear, never really accepting the message. Um, then as soon as I graduated high school, I joined the Army. Went to basic training, went to AIT, went to Airborne School, went to the 82nd Airborne, got to the 82nd Airborne, and they're like, well, we have to fast track your in-processing into your unit. Okay, what does that mean? It means in six weeks you're leaving the country. I'm like, okay, this is great. This is what I joined the military for. Go overseas, fight for my country. I'd been in country and Iraq for about four months. We had been working with this one village for about two months. And we would do what was called presence patrols. We'd go down there, we'd walk through the village. Um, I would bring my medical supplies with me and I had my medical supplies out of the back of the truck. A lot of times we would deal with small things, flus, injuries there was a lot of kids that would get hurt and stuff out there and we would treat them and stuff like that so i got to build up a little bit of rapport with the locals and talk to them a lot and one time on one of my presence patrols 
I was out there walking through town, and this one man who always, he was always kind of separate from everybody else, and he never really interacted with us much, came up to me and handed me a Bible, and he says, can you hold this for me until the next time you come back? Um, I know Saddam's death squads are coming into the town next week, and if he sees this, they will kill me. So I took the Bible, kind of scared, because this isn't something we normally do. We are taught not to get involved with those type of situations, because it can cause other international problems getting involved. But something told me to take it. I took this Bible, and we came back into town a couple oh. weeks later, and I brought it back with me, and gave it back to this man, but it was just the overreaching power and faith this man had to be in a country that the penalty for being a Christian is not persecution, it is straight up death. It is straight up he would be killed if he was caught worshiping the Lord. And that he had the faith and the, you know, discipline to follow the Lord, even though his actions would eventually lead him to death. I mean, there is no it. it it's going to happen. I mean, the way that country was going at that time, it was going to happen. And he had enough faith. If that God was powerful enough, and this God that I heard about was powerful enough to keep him alive in that kind of situation, why was I not following him? Why was I not being up there with him and being a soldier in a place where I'm readily accepted as a Christian? I can stand up here and tell my story all I want and talk to as many people in this place as I want about my story and my belief in my God, and the worst I'm going to get out of it is, oh, you're just one of those Bible-thumping Christians. You're just one of those preachers that want to preach to me. Nobody's trying to shoot me for my religion. Nobody wants to kill me because I'm spreading the word to them. But this man is out there doing that. It gave me the faith to really turn around and follow Christ. Um, from that time, after that deployment, my next two deployments... My goal was the entire time I was at my deployment, for the one-year deployment, I would read the entire Bible from beginning to end in each deployment. And both my last two deployments, I've read the Bible from beginning to end at my deployments. And this man actually did go forward. I saw him on my next deployment to Iraq because I was in the same area, and he is actually working at the base that I had started at that time, and we were actually first building and it became a big fob and he is actually working at it. It's actually now called the Liberty Striker Complex. And it was a really big base of operations for that part of Iraq until we pulled out. But that was kind of how I came to really understand the power of the Lord and really who he was and really took the next steps to becoming a Christian and building a personal relationship and not just standing there and nodding my head and following along and listening. Well, not even much listening. I just followed along and nodded my head to what the pastor said. And that's where I come from. Thank you very much. to Brian's story. When I first met him, the Lord kept on showing me, that's my son, watch over him, because he is going to be one of my disciples. And it's been a privilege to see his growth. And to me, you know, that showed that my encouragement. Oh, what the power of God when he chooses you. Right. And it's such a blessing yes. to to know him. He's part of I call him part of my family. Right. Uh, it's interesting because I will guarantee you that that gentleman over in Iraq had no idea how far reaching mm -hmm. his relationship with Christ was. Oh. I mean, <clears throat> chances are he never went very far from there. 
And yet God used him to breathe life into Brian and encouragement into you and encouragement to us. Amen. So uh, God's arm is never too short. All right, um, back to our series. Um, a couple things that I want to just touch on briefly before we get into. If you have your Bible, go ahead and flip over to, uh, there's two places that we're going to be today. Um, Acts chapter 6 and Ephesians chapter 4. Now I just want to kind of recap uh, where we're at. Um, a couple weeks back, we talked about our identity. Um, we talked about uh, in Peter, how Peter is talking to uh, the church and he's using the same terms that God used for the nation of Israel. He's using the same terms for us as believers. Uh, and that's in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says that we are a chosen race. Israel is a chosen race. And I say it's because we did not replace Israel. Okay? God has promises and covenants with Israel that will be fulfilled. If you're not sure about that, read Romans 9, 10, 11. Okay? God is faithful to his promises. Even when we are faithless, God holds true to the covenants and the promises that he's made. Okay? Uh, if you have been paying attention at all to what's going on over in the Middle East, and I would encourage you, pay particular attention to what's going on in Israel and in the surrounding countries. Go back to Ezekiel uh, 38, 39, and look at the Ezekiel War, and we see the pieces being put in place today. All of those countries listed in Ezekiel are now forming an alliance around Israel. So I would encourage you, pay attention. Okay? First thing we got to do, we got to quit thinking America-centric. All right? When God wrote his word, uh, I, I believe that God has blessed our nation incredibly. I think we have... Uh, for a large part, thrown that blessing back into his face. I think there will come a time of judgment on our nation. Uh, and I think that's actually going to be one of the best things that could happen. Because God's going to wake his church up and she's going to remember that she is powerful. Okay? So uh, you pay attention to what's going on over in the Middle East. Um, it's very exciting if you understand the prophecies. We are seeing these things coming to pass. Okay? So, <clears throat> we are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. And uh, we only see the fulfillment of this in Jesus Christ. Because when God established the priesthood, he didn't choose uh, the tribe of Judah to be the priest. He chose the Aaronic line out of the tribe of Levi. Okay, And we, we need to keep these things in mind because those are a foreshadow of what's coming and what has come. All right, So a royal priesthood, this is the fulfillment of Jesus Christ who is a priest after, he's a high priest after the order of okay. Melchizedek, not Aaron. Okay, uh, And Melchizedek's uh, line has neither beginning nor end. Jesus' line has neither beginning nor end. Okay? Uh, a royal priesthood. So Jesus being king, being master, and being our high priest. A holy nation. Uh, holy simply meaning set apart. Okay? We're, we're not part of the common. God has pulled us out and made us holy as he is holy. And a people for his own possession. We belong to God. Right? Right? Okay, if you're not sure about that, please come talk to me. Okay, I'm serious. Because if, if you're not sure about that, if you are not stoked about being God's own possession, being in the very hand of God, that none can shake you loose, then you really don't understand what's going on. You really don't. Okay? Um, so, uh, uh, one of the other things that we are, uh, as far as our identity, uh, 
Paul writes and he says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Yeah. Okay? That, that means that the person that we were before, Paul says that person is dead. Gone. Now, unfortunately, uh, we still, when we come to Christ, we still have to work out our salvation, not earning our salvation. We're working out becoming what our salvation is. Okay? That's called maturity. Okay? Growing in Christ. Learning those things that, that God does not want. And, and getting rid of those things and taking on those things that he does want. You want an example of that? Go look in Galatians 5. Look at the, the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. We should be moving appreciably, understandably, observably. We need to be moving from the works of the flesh into the fruit of the Spirit. Increasingly. Now, now remember... Don't let the devil get you because you're not there perfectly. Because none of us are going to be there perfectly this side of heaven. Okay? So don't let the enemy bring condemnation because you, you stumble. God's grace covers that. You got your music, right? Yes. Okay. And I, that wasn't the horn, so... Um, all right, so we are a new creation. We are still working to put off those things from the old man. We're becoming a new creation. We are becoming reflectors, mirrors of Christ, so that as we progress in our maturity and as we grow in our faith, we become more and more like him. Okay? All right, so that's our identity. We are a new creation. We are a holy nation. Uh, we are holy unto God. We are separate from the world. Um, now, being that we are a royal priesthood, we, we looked at when God called Israel, we looked at that he chose them to be a nation of priests, and then he, he refined that further to being uh, the, the priesthood, being in the tribe of Levi, and even further to the line of Aaron. Uh, and, and the priesthood, uh, as God set it up, was to be those that worked on behalf of God to the people and behalf of people to the God, to God, okay? They were the ones that would offer the sacrifices. They were the ones that would make the atonement. They were the ones, uh, the high priest, that would go in on the high day of the year and, and make sacrifice, first for himself and his family. And then he would go back in and make sacrifice for all of the sins of the nation of Israel that they were unaware of, Okay? Uh, because if you were aware of a sin, that was your responsibility to go and make sacrifice for. Okay, so he would go in and, and make sacrifice for the entire nation of Israel. Now, we are, God is, is bringing this thing full circle back around. We are a royal priesthood, meaning that, that we now have access to do everything that they had before. Now, one thing I want to say just real quick. When God chose Aaron and his sons and their descendants to be the priests... Um, at that point, there was the tabernacle, and the tabernacle was moving because they were wandering around in the desert. And so the priests were in no wise able to carry all of this stuff. Uh, so God gave to them the tribe of Levi and made them holy to be the assistants, to be the helpers of the priests. And, and each part of the tribe of Levi was given a certain area that they were responsible for. You guys are responsible for picking up and carrying the posts for the, the curtain around the tabernacle. You guys are responsible for carrying the curtains. And, and you guys are responsible for carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And, and everybody had their job. Okay? Now, moving forward, we see that God has called his bride to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And so we see that there is no difference there, one of the things that uh, religion has done is it, it has given um, a division in the bride of Christ that scripture does not have okay? uh, if you've grown up in a number of churches uh, a lot of them <coughs> excuse me <coughs> have this separation between clergy and laity, okay? There's, there's the, uh, the people that are like in type with God and are called to minister on his behalf, 
and then there's the rest of us that didn't quite get, you know, whether we didn't muster or weren't called to it, but there's a separation between clergy and laity. Folks, there is no separation in Scripture. There's a separation in, in tasks. There's a separation in calling what God has called you to do. But if God calls you a priest, then guess what? You're a priest. All right? And, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll leave that alone for now. But all of us are called to be priests. So, but now we do come to this kind of weird thing. Um, when Jesus ministered here on the earth, uh, how many disciples did he have? Lots. We don't know how many he had. But we know that there were more than just the 12 that he called out. <coughs> Excuse me. They were called out to be apostles. Apostolos, that means a messenger, somebody who is given charge and authority to carry out what the king has said, to be a representative. Uh, Second Corinthians chapter 5 calls us ambassadors. Okay? So the apostolos, the, the apostles, they were given a, a calling and a commission that was different than the rest of the disciples. Okay? Now are they any more important? No, because how can you measure infinite love and say there's uh, infinite love to Peter and infinite love to me, but somehow Peter's greater? Uh, when Jesus went to the cross, he went on all of our behalves. Now, um, there will be a difference uh, as far as what we are called to, and, and on the other side of that, when we get to heaven, there will be a difference in the rewards. Okay, Because when the Christian gets to heaven... And, and the, the father says, well done, you will be judged off of what you've done with the gifts and the, the talents that God has given you. Okay? And, and some will receive great rewards, uh, just like the parable of the talents, to one that had the ability, he was given three, and he reproduced three more. To the one that uh, uh, had other talents, he was given two, and gained two more. And then to the last one, yeah, you know, that should wake you up because if you're not being used of God, you really need to examine your faith. You need to examine your relationship with God so that you can understand what he is calling you to because there's not a single person in the history of the world that has been called to salvation that was not also called to some tasking of God. Okay? And they're, they're different. So don't freak out thinking, oh gosh, do I have to be a pastor? No. That may not be your call at all. However, uh, just, just from the voice of experience, uh, I graduated uh, college in 1992. I was on the fast track. I did my four-year degree in only six years. Uh, but also in that six years, uh, I got married and had three children. So I, I gave myself a little bit extra time. Um, kids are expensive. Um, okay, so within the calling of the body of Christ, there is an order. Now, we have to remember, as we get into this, order is not a matter of value. Okay? It's not a matter of value. We look, uh, you know, a cup of water is of incredible value to a person that's in the desert. To a person that's in the sea, not so much. Okay? We need to remember that our calling, our place in the body, has nothing to do with our value before God. Because Jesus paid the ultimate price for every one of us. And we, we, we do this bizarre thing where we start giving precedence and we start and, and the disciples did too and we see this in the gospels we see it in the book of acts uh, we see it in paul's writings you know uh, paul who was an apostle late as one untimely born uh he had the moxie to go stand up to peter and say hey what you're doing is wrong okay uh peter one of the three pillars of the church Paul withstood him to his face and called him on the carpet and said, hey, that's your, what you're doing, that's wrong. Okay? So don't, don't fall into the trap of believing that the place that God has called you to in his body, in the church, is somehow less valuable than another position. Okay? 
All right. So, in the body, uh, we see it. We just talked about that uh, God had called, Jesus had called 12 that he made apostles, but there were many, many disciples. As a matter of fact, if you look in uh, uh, Acts, you see that uh, they, they needed to replace uh, Judas, and, and uh, as one of the 12, they had a hole, and, and they set up some conditions, and they said that, they, that this, this man had to be with us from the beginning. Okay, and, and so that we know there were at least two that were with him from the beginning that were not apostles. Okay, so, um, but we also see something interesting happening here. So if, you, if you're there, flip over to uh, Acts chapter 6. Um, because God is a God of order and not disorder. You know, um, it, it cracks me up. Um, you know, I have a, a number of friends that uh, they do church differently than we do church. Um, and it's, it's not better or worse, but I always laugh when they say, well, you know, we don't, we don't have a, an organized structure in our church. You know, this week this one will preach and, and the next week that one will teach. And, and I'm sorry, but, but you cannot exist without order of some type. Okay? The fact that you said this week this person will teach and next week that person will that's order. That's order. Yeah, that's how it works. It's order. Okay? So in Acts chapter 6, we see the, uh, in, in previous chapters, we see the birth of the church. We see that, that the Spirit has been given to empower the church. Uh, and why was the Spirit given to empower the church? Why, why did the church need to be empowered? So they can do the work, the task that they were given. Okay. Um, when we get into the gifts, actually, because we're going to get into the gifts, there's something that I want to say today. So just so you guys know where I'm at, I absolutely believe the gifts are for today. Absolutely. I believe the Spirit of God is active in the church today. I think the the, the gifts of the Spirit in the church in America. That, that we've gone one of two directions. And it's unfortunate because on the one side, we have the people that say, no, the, the gifts are not for today. To which I say, are you not watching what God is doing in North Africa and in the Middle East and in China and, and in Iran? Do you not see the things that God is doing there? He is moving by the power that is his. He is, he is bringing people to himself through miraculous signs and wonders. <sighs> And how arrogant are we to say, oh, no, that's not God. Because I, we have a story about that in Scripture, remember? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because the Pharisees came and they said, oh, it's, it's by the power of Beelzebub that he drives out demons. It's not by the power of God. And how did Jesus respond? Huh, a house divided against itself will not stand. And if I drive out demons by the power of Beelzebub, who are they driving demons out by? Okay, so the, the, the gifts are definitely for use today. Now the problem is, you know, on, on the one pendulum we say, oh no, they're not for today. That was, the perfect has come. What's the perfect? Well, they, they want to say God's word, but God's word itself says that it's incomplete. It has everything we need as to life and godliness, but it's not the whole story. Because, you know, John writes, well, you know, I suppose if we put everything in that Jesus did and all the things that were going on, there wouldn't be enough paper in the world. But we have what's needful, okay? Because the story's still ongoing. Because I don't find my name in the Bible anywhere. I've looked. The letters are there. They're just not assembled correctly, okay? And as near as I can tell, most of you are not in there, except where we are referred to generally as those who are far off, okay? So the other side of the pendulum, we have people that I, I'm sorry. But the spirit that is moving on those people is not the spirit of God. There is a maturity and an understanding according to the word of God, whereby the gifts are used and the purpose to which they are to be used for. And I'm sorry, but if the, the charismatic church of this bo whatever body, not, not ours, I'm just saying, speaking generally, is more excited about the gifts of God and is lacking in the fruit, uh, if, if they're more excited about the gifts of the Spirit and they're lacking in the fruit of the Spirit, uh, it's not the God of the Bible that they're following. It's not. 
Okay? Remember, we are to pursue love, chasing that thing down, never giving up, and we are to desire gifts. All too often those are flipped. We pursue gifts and only desire love. All right? So, um, somewhere between these two poles, I believe there is, there is the balance that God desires because Paul, in addressing this issue, uh, in speaking about tongues and prophecy in 1 Corinthians 14, he tells us that God is a God of order, not disorder. Now, what does that look like? We'll get into that when we get into uh, the gifts in 1 Corinthians, okay? Um, there's a lot to be said there. So I just wanted you guys to understand, I absolutely believe that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. They're being used today. Uh, I also, unfortunately, I believe that a lot of times they're being used incorrectly. That they're being used to bring uh, accolades to the person with the gift rather than being directing that person, to that gift to God. Okay? So, segue. Now we're back. All right. So, uh, as the church has been birthed, as, as it has been empowered by the Spirit, so that they might be, bear witness and testimony to the things that God has done through the life of Jesus Christ, we come to a logistics problem, okay? And, um, you know, there's life happens. Life happens. There's things that j you just got to deal with. Um, don't believe me? Try not paying your taxes. <laughs> Try not paying your mortgage. Try driving on the other side of the highway, okay? There are certain things that just have to be in place. And we see this uh, happening in Acts chapter 6. So verse 1. Now in these days, and this is the, the early days of the church. The church is, is booming. They're bringing in people to the, the message of the gospel of Christ. The majority of the people that they're bringing in are Jews. Okay? Remember that the church was started among Israel first. Okay? And, and just like the bell curve, you know, we see that the Spirit is given, the church is birthed in Israel, and then we see it swing through the book of, uh, of Acts. We see it swing over to the Gentiles. The time of Gentiles will end, and it will come back to the nation of Israel. Nothing is going to be left undone. All right? So, uh, now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, or yours might say Greek, uh, arose against the Hebrews because their widows were, were being delect, oh, delected, <laughs> neglected, neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve, these are the apostles, and, and uh, please note that there is a difference between disciple and apostle, and, and this doesn't make sense if you, you don't separate those two terms, okay? And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Perminus, and Nicolaus, and a, a, a proselyte of Antioch. These they sent before the apostles, again, apostles, not disciples, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Okay, so, here's, here's logistics problem. Um, we see that God established the nation of Israel. And he put down uh, very clear guidelines as to how they were to act. And one of the things that he did, um, he made a way for the poor to be able to eat and to sustain themselves. Okay? But it wasn't just by handing them something, was it? No, what he did is he told them, hey, when you bring in your harvest, don't reap all the way to the edges of your field. Leave it 
so that the poor might come and have some. When you, you beat the olives off of the tree, don't go a second time, but leave some so the poor and can come and get them, and the grapes. And, and, but, but do you see what the, the key thing is about this in the whole process here? They weren't to, to gather it all together and then pick it up and bring it to the poor. The poor were supposed to come out and gather it. We see this in the book of Ruth, where Ruth is sent out to gather, okay? And, and we see that Boaz actually even shows her favor by telling the, the harvesters, he says, hey, leave some for her, okay? Make sure she gets some, all right? So, <clears throat> The church being Jewish in nature, <coughs> excuse me, they understand what's going on here. They see that the, the <coughs> excuse me, good grief, I got a water bone. <coughs> All right. Um, the, the widows and the orphans needed something to eat, so they were distributing amongst them. The Hellenistic Jews, those that came from uh, Greece, yeah. Hellenistic just means Greece, okay, Greek, all right? Hey, Helena Troy, which she wasn't from Troy, she was from Greece, um, they're, they're called Hellenists, okay? So when you see the word Hellenist, just think Greek. Now the word Greek, a lot of times in scripture, does not mean Greek people. It's used as a contrast between the Jews and the Greeks being the world, the rest of the people that are not Jews, okay? Um, that's why Paul says that there is neither Jew nor Greek, okay? Because if that's the only two people that made it into heaven, we're all in trouble. Is anybody here Greek? Okay, I, I like the, I like baklava. No. Um, I don't know, but if you find them, tell, send them my way. Um, okay, so they run into this issue where the Jews were being served but the, the Greek, the, the others, were not being served. Now, they bring it to the apostles. And one of the things that, that we have to be aware of, and we see happened over and over in Scripture, is that a lot of times um, a person is called to a position and a task, and so we hand all of the positions and tasks to that person. Okay? Uh, we see this in Exodus with Moses. Um, his, his father-in-law was there, and, and he's watching as all the people bring their, their petitions and their disagreements and their arguments to Moses, and, and he pulls Moses aside. He says, why are you doing this? Are there not other men in this entire nation who are capable of judging? Are you the only one? And, and Moses goes, oh, yeah. yeah. Sometimes we overlook the obvious, don't we? Um, and we, we see over and over again that uh, men that are called to a place are given responsibilities beyond what God wants them to have, okay? So moving in here, we see the same thing happening. We see that there's an obligation uh, by the elders to the people, and, and the people come and remind them of this obligation, and they go, well, you know, gosh, what we have been called to is, is to take the message out. As apostles, as, as the messengers, we are the ones that have been commissioned to take this message out. And we can't do that efficiently if we're standing here giving out dinner and breakfast and lunch. That takes time away from what we're supposed to be doing. Aha, I know. Let's take an example from Moses and, and let's appoint men to take care of this. Now, this right here is the establishment of what we call deacons, okay? Diakonos. Uh, diakonos simply means server, okay? Someone who serves, someone who labors on behalf of others. As a matter of fact, in, in the context that it's used, it, it actually comes across as a, a, a waiter, a table waiter, okay? And their job is to look after the physical needs of the body, right? Um, they, they are to make sure that the things that need to be taken care of in the natural are being taken care of. Now, what are the qualifications? Well, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute, but, but the, the qualifications for a deacon are every bit as high as the qualifications for an elder. They are called to the same integrity. 
They're called to the same lifestyle. They're called to the same witness and representation. So it's not a matter of value. Absolutely not. It's a matter of calling. Okay? So when, you know, uh, the church that I grew up in, um, you had the pastor, and then you had the elders, and then you had the deacons, and then you had the wives. No, I'm kidding. But, but then under, underneath the deacons, then you had all the different ministry heads. Okay? I, I believe that is a non-biblical design. Uh, my personal belief, and we'll get into these as we go along in Ephesians 4, uh, I believe that the pastor is actually one of a group of elders. Okay? That, that, that there is an eldership that needs to be in place, and they are gifted with the calling of God to serve as an elder. They're, they're given the call to intercede, to spend time in prayer, to give them the call to teach the word and to preach the word. Those are the focuses of what they're called to do. And the deacons, who have all of the, the qualifications of the elder as far as how they live their life, they have a different focus, okay? And their focus is to take care of the needs that the body has, the physical needs. No, they're not, uh, they're not going to be praying less. They're still going to be praying over these things. But the call and the direction of their focus is different than the call and the direction of the elders. All right? So we see the establishment of a second group of people, um, the deacons. And then let's, let's flip over to uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to just touch on this today. And then next week we're going to start tearing this thing apart. Okay? Is everybody with me? Everybody's understanding what's going on here. Okay? Not a matter of value. Um, quite honestly, I believe in heaven, a lot of the, the ministry that goes on that we don't see is going to be held in higher esteem and honor than some of those that we do see. Uh, I think a lot of uh, people that are serving the church today, uh, they're already getting their rewards. They're getting them here on earth, okay? Um, and that's, that's actually a, a fairly sad thing to see. So, um, Ephesians chapter 4, um, I'm going to read from verse 1 down. Um, now, Paul being Paul, he's the master of run-on sentences. So, we're, we're going to read before and after so we understand in context what's happening, okay? Okay. So, in verse 4, um, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, I want to encourage you, you take time to back up and understand why the therefore is there. Okay? Because you, you don't just start a sentence with therefore. That's a transitional statement. Okay? So, um, worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Wow. We, we could do a whole series just on that verse, couldn't we? Um, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And then verse 9, we have this parenthetical statement. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far from above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Now verse 11. And he, being Christ, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, or pastors, some of you might have pastors, and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, 
to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so just want to touch a couple points before we get into verse 11. Um, we really have got to grasp this whole concept of unity, this whole concept of one. Okay? Uh, you look at the list that he has given us. There is one body. Okay? That means that even though our fellowship is here and we are a part of that body, the other churches that are around are still parts of the one body that is the bride of Christ. Uh, that one body of whom Christ is head. Okay, so um, no. we have different preferences in the ways that we do things. Um, uh, we we tend to be pretty moderate in in uh, our worship and and in our approach. There are some that are much more traditional. Uh, there are some that are much more. I don't, I don't want to say liberal or conservative because that carries a wrong idea. Um, Contemporary. Radical. Okay. Um, what was that? Contemporary. Contempt. Yes. Contem well, that's that's interesting because what was contemporary when I was a kid is now considered old. Um, so, but yeah, there's they are more progressive. Okay. Um, now, is there right or wrong? There may be to your preference, but apart from deviating from scripture. As long as they are theologically sound, and as long as their doctrine is correct, you know, let them have two drum sets. Let them have electric guitar. You don't have to worship them. You can go to a place that, that it, you know, um, doesn't have those. And it's, 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 it's really not a judgment that you're more or less mature at all. It's a, it's a matter of preference. It's a matter of what enables you to worship God. Okay? Because that's really what it's all about, isn't it? Yes. Okay. To, to be able to worship. Now, not to put the onus on the worship team, okay, or the song selection, or on the message, okay? When you come into a church, you are going to be served a meal. It's going to be laid out before you. If you walk away without having fed, that's your fault. That's your responsibility, okay? Uh, when we were in Israel, Fish. That looks like fish. That's not breaded. And, you know, I mean, it looks at you. I had a salad that day. But, but they, they like fish. Now, is there anything wrong? There's nothing wrong with fish. If you like fish, okay? Um, they had, oh my gosh, they had so many different kinds of cheese. And so many of them looked the same and tasted nothing like each other. Genie, what's this kind? Oh, that's really good. Here, you can have it. Okay? It's, it's a matter of preference. It doesn't mean you're more or less mature. As long as you're progressing in faith, then, then be where God has put you. But if God has put you there, dig in and start working on his behalf in the body of Christ where he has placed you. Okay? So, I'm going to stop there for today. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to break apart the five-fold uh, ministry gifts in verse 11 and what those gifts are called to. Okay? And, and hopefully, uh, as we go through these things, you'll start to see that maybe maybe God has called you to something that you weren't really thinking he called you to. Okay? And, and, or maybe even what, what I think might be better yet is you might start appreciating what God has called you to. Instead of thinking of, of it as a labor, uh, you will consider it a joy. All right? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for your spirit that brings understanding. We thank you, Father, that you have not left us alone. I lift this message up to you, Father. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. 
that, Father, as we go forth, your word would continue to enrich our lives, that your spirit would open our eyes to see what we cannot see and open our minds to understand what we cannot understand. And I just ask, God, that this would all be done to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.